join me in welcoming our guests tonight. Um, so, like I said, this is a journey of thinking about unique approaches to creative building and building that process and how it relates to you in your creative journey. And um, think about your challenges and how you can uh, change that with creative thinking. All right, without further ado, I'll let you duke it out. Who wants to go first? Well, thank you. I'm sort of disappointed I can't use the mic. That was going to make me feel really Oprah-esque. Go ahead. No, I'm <laughs> I'll talk loud. I, just, I had visions. I was like, this is my 15 minutes. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. I'm very excited to um, be with this group. It's really an honor. Um, I do find a certain irony in the fact that I'm here to speak about creativity to a group of creatives. Um, that is a fairly intimidating task to be asked to do. Um, however, I'm a sociologist. Um, I like to think of myself as being a creative thinker. I have some notes that I'm going to use because there's certain things that I really want to get through and get out to ground this conversation. Um, I was planning on speaking for maybe 15 or 20 minutes. At any time you want to interrupt me, feel free. I won't be insulted. That's already warned me at 20 minutes. She's cutting me off of my knees, <laughs> making me sit and giving Dennis a chance for his moment in the sun. Um, at any rate, so that was my plan. Um, as a sociologist, I am fairly obsessed with patterns, uh, cultural themes, and ideas, and I'm not especially afraid to go out on the limb. Again, as you see, taking an enormous risk speaking to creatives on creativity. Sociologists, in general, are interested in identity issues. That's what we love to talk about. How do we know who we are? This is what sociologists are primarily interested in, in their research, in their reading, and in their talk. Why do we think the way we do? Why do we behave the way we behave? And so tonight, I'm hoping to pull you into my world a little bit as we discuss getting back in touch with the source of your own creativity. Or where does this creativity come from? What does creativity mean? And how is it that we attach a sense of creativity to our identity as a whole? OK, now bear with me. For two minutes, we're going to do Sociology 101. It's going to be a little bit boring. Pretend you're a freshman in college. But it's OK. We're going to get through it. Sociology 101, Berger and Luckman. Remember that, OK? If you go to a cocktail party sometime, you might be able to say, I know something about Berger and Luckman. And people will think you're smart. So just stick with me for two minutes. I'm okay? writing that down. Berger and Luckman. 1960, Berger and Luckman, social construction. Berger and Luckman start writing and stressing that human knowledge of the world is socially constructed. What does that mean? We apprehend our understanding of the world through our social situations and our social interactions with other people. So we know, if this is true, that our perspective is partial at best. Because guess what? We're only around for our own interactions. It's interesting when you think about it that way. Think about why you believe what you believe about yourself. Why you believe what you believe about your family, about your community. You believe these things because of past interactions and social context. Irving Goffman, another cocktail party name-dropping thing, used to use the metaphor of Shakespeare. What is that? Um, all of life's a stage, right? So constantly, we have a backdrop shifting and changing. Think of yourselves in, sociology, in sociological terms as existing on that stage with the backdrop changing, only we don't even realize how much that influences us. We learn every day what it means to be human in all of its contexts what it means to be an artist, a woman, a man, a mother, a worker. Nothing, nothing, I repeat that, has meaning in of itself. It is the relationship of concepts to one another that generate meaning. OK, Sociology 101 is almost over. One more guy. Mike Foucault, French philosopher. Mike Foucault says we have systems in place that encourage us to self-regulate without the act of threat of punishment. We internalize the managerial gaze that watches over us. And I want you all to think big brother. Think big brother. Or maybe it is easier to think about that stop sign that you always come to a complete stop at at night 
in the dark in the middle of a parking lot with no parts in it. <laughs> that is that managerial game of Big Brother watching you. Now the problem with these combined truths is the following, and I want to give you a metaphor. Every morning we all get up, right? We wake up, we brush our teeth, take a shower, blow dry our hair, get ready to leave the house, get dressed. I want to imagine that in addition to that, whether you realize it or not, all of us every day are also putting on a full Velcro suit and a specially made electric dog collar, the kind that people have for their backyard fences, their electric fences. And so when you leave the house every single day in your Velcro suit with your electric fence dog collar, what do you think happens? <laughs> you end up collecting a whole lot of stuff that doesn't belong to you. A whole lot of expectations and ideologies and generally just crazy mixed up ideas about what it means to be successful, what it means to be happy, what it means to be human. In addition, with your collar on, you're getting shocked every time you cross one of these imaginary boundaries. Oops, war belt to the airport, <coughs> shock. Oops, you made a liberal comment at the country club, oh, shock. <laughs> <laughs> now this may not have been a big issue if you worked in a factory in 1930. Okay, 1930, you're a factory worker. Very specific tasks, very specific roles. You go to work, I am worker. I am father, I am breadwinner, I know who I am, right? But for most of this, this is not reflective of our day-to-day -day reality in 2009. The postmodern age, or as some people like to say, the post-postmodern age, come back for a three-hour lecture on that, we have become what we refer to as splintered cells or fragmented aspects of a whole, and very, very, very few of us only play one or two roles, and very, very, very few of those roles are so narrowly defined anymore. This is where the stress comes in. We are all changing our hats all day long, while simultaneously being bombarded by the visual landscape, noise, and a dizzying array of cultural expectations, while wearing our Velcro suits and our electric dog collars. Not a pretty picture. But here's the optimistic part, the part I'm really excited to tell you. Here is what I want to tell you about creativity. At your very essence, all of us are creativity in action. And I mean that very, very literally. The core basis of who you are, who I am, and who everyone in the kitchen is, is a creative spirit. And I really want everyone in the room to think about this just for one second. Take off your Velcro suit and your electric dog collar, and don't be embarrassed if you have two collars on or extra footing. We're all wearing it. And for one minute, I want you to think about the tulip bulbs you planted in your yard this year. Just think about them. You plant those bulbs, and what happens? They come up in the spring. They come up in the spring. Funny how that happens, isn't it? Or how about your newborn baby? Funny how he seems to know how to grow without your ever telling him what to do. That is how creativity works. It flows if you let it be. And the question is how? In this crazy, mixed-up world we live in, do we tap into that beautiful flow of ideas? Do you remember being a child and the ideas would just come game after game after game of inventive play? It's the world that gets in our way, or at least the way in which we interpret the world or let that world interpret us. It's that Velcro suit and dog collar that we slip into at the age of seven 
They don't call it the age of reason for nothing. And this is a very, very real problem. Now with my students, I often use an analogy of cleaning out the garage. And what is the first thing that anybody who's cleaned out their garage, I haven't in a while, but if you have, what's the first thing you do when you clean out your garage on a Saturday morning? Take everything out. Take all the stuff out. Take everything out. <laughs> Take everything out, right? Put it all in the yard. The first thing you have to do is make a big old mess. That is the problem with cleaning the garage. This is messy. And it's complicated and it's dusty and you're sneezing and you're not happy and you're sweating. And you got your soup on and your coffee. <laughs> now obviously, that's impossible to do with identity. And the truth is, identity is really important. We all have to have an identity in order to operate in the world successfully. That's Freud, right? That's our ego. We have to have an ego. We have to have an identity that we use. It's the only way we recognize one another. But we can also be aware of what is really ourselves and what is falsely ourselves. And in this, we can start to create a relationship where we actually can have an opportunity to reintroduce ourselves to ourselves. And so how do we do this? Well, as I said before, I generally lecture for three hours, and that's hold me 20 minutes. And Dennis said, you're gonna write down notes? I mean, I'm an academic, I'm into ideas. This is very hard for me to go off my books. In fact, today, I started to get overwhelmed because I thought, oh, I, don't, I don't have enough stuff. And I had like all my books in my den, and I was thinking about all of these different ideas, and I was so overwhelmed, and I got angry. I thought, why did they invent the internet? Why? <laughs> why? I really feel like I have to know everything. But here are the rules. I've got five simple rules as an introduction to our conversation about creativity. And I'm going to quickly go through them and then let Dennis talk about his process of being creative, and feel free then to ask questions in the little folks. Here are my five rules. First rule, I call it the black turtleneck rule. Years ago, I used to do art gallery tours. And when I did the, oh, I love the picture. <laughs> I'm a sociology professor, are you kidding? <laughs> Years ago, I used to do art gallery tours. And I used to have this rule called the black turtleneck. And what the black turtleneck refers to is the fact, now all of us on a Saturday have gone to various art galleries, right? And you go in and you're all excited to look at the beautiful art in the wall. And you walk in and the first thing you see is some leggy blonde and a pair of black skinny jeans and black leather boots and a black <laughs> turtleneck. And you're halfway in the door and you're terrified she's gonna ask you about Marxist theory at the turn of the century. And before you can even ask how much anything on the walls is, you're like back, you know, I'm sorry I came in, I'm really sorry I came in, I know I don't belong here. That's the black turtleneck rule. Rather than put on our Velcro suit and our electric dog fence collar in the morning, you should hook yourself up to a self-confidence machine. A little ivy, a little juice, a little self-confidence. You've got to believe in yourself and not be intimidated by what someone's going to ask you, what you don't know, because we're all faking it. Two, creativity is not a project. It is to be lived. The best creativity that ever happens is in the moment, right? In the conversation, right? We're all creative all the time. And so when we sit down and think of creativity as an aspect of our personality, we're denying the fact that it's truly our essence. And then we're mixing up some strange ideas about what it means to be creative. I'm only creative if I wear XYZ boots. I'm only creative if I work at XYZ place. Not so much. You're creative by virtue of being alive. You are a creative spirit. Creativity is not a project, it's to be lived. Third rule, matching games are for preschoolers. What do I mean by that? All right, well, when I was in graduate school, <coughs> first semester I wrote a paper on children's literature. Love this paper, like 47,000 references. Really pleased with myself, I got an A on it. <laughs> I then proceeded to rewrite it about 46 times during graduate school. 
By the end of graduate school, I was so bored of children's literature. I didn't care anymore. If the paper was flat. I think the last time I turned it in, I got a C. There was nothing left. You've got to be willing to take risks. You've got to be willing to take on new ideas. You've got to be willing to let go of old ideas or the thought that you might be able to transform the same idea over and over and over again. Fourth, opposites attract. I like this one. And I actually got it from a studio art instructor. She didn't come up with opposite attracts. She just came up with the idea that we never think laterally. When you sit down and you think to yourself, I want to be creative, try to come up with what we sociologists refer to as binary oppositions. What are binary oppositions? Pleasure, pain, heat, cold, light, dark, science, nature. And make connections between these things. Creativity is about connection. It's about finding the lightness in the darkness. It's about finding the cold in the heat. And when we start to be able to play around with those oppositional ideas, we start to be able to draw connections and make meaning, frequently meaning that wasn't there before. And my last and my very most important rule, I really like this one. If you come away tonight with only one thing, this is my rule. A watch pot never boils. Ideas <coughs> pop when you learn to walk away. Now, I will tell you a secret. My weapon. I am a 16-year transcendental meditator, like Paul McCartney, like Jerry uh, Steinfeld, like Al Gore. A lot of people have good ideas. I like, I like that crowd, putting myself with that crowd, like my mother. <laughs> ideas are in the silence. And you have to have a way to get to the silence. It used to be, forgive me if I'm going over my 20 minutes. This is one thought that I have to finish. One minute. <laughs> one minute. This gets back to the dizzying array of visual imagery that's coming at us all the time. All of us in this room have had a moment of transcendence. I know this. You're on your bike, you're riding, the wind is blowing in your hair, and for one glorious sweet moment, you forget where you are. It's a moment of transcendence. I think in the past, there were more opportunities to have access to moments like this. In the post-postmodern age, those moments are few and fleeting. I sit with my students all the time. They're students of yours as well. They're in their Gap baseball caps, their Abercrombie shirt, their Nike t-shirt, drinking their Starbucks, sitting and saying, I never watch TV. I'm not at all influenced by advertising. I mean, you don't know me. I'm just really creative. Yeah, right. Hello. <laughs> you can't leave your house. You can't open your eyes without being attacked. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> by noise, by distraction, by interruption. And if you have a practice, for me it's my TM. I can talk about that later if you're interested. To get silent. For you it might be yoga. Think of yourself. Instead of being in a Velcro suit with an electric fence dog collar, think of yourself as that tulip bulb. That tulip bulb doesn't care if it's red or yellow. That tulip bulb doesn't expect anybody to watch over it every single day. That tulip bulb just knows what to do. Because that tulip bulb rests. It takes in the nourishment of the soil and the sun. And it does all of the things that it needs to do in order to turn its face towards the sun. If there's one thing that I can offer everyone in this room, it's to allow yourself to be your own authentic self, to get back in touch with who that person is, and to try as try you might. Read a book. Daniel Pink's got a great book out right now on creativity. David Lynch has an awesome book on creativity. Try to be aware of all the things you're picking up that aren't really what you are. Thank you.
and try to be cognizant of all those moments you're getting zapped. And rather than responding with anger, figure out a way to walk around the electric fence. You can do it. So there you have it. My five rules, my intro to thinking about creativity, my very brief thumbnail sketch of Sociology 101. You can all now officially go to a cocktail party and sound smart. Remember that, Berger and Luckman, Foucault, <laughs> Irving Goffman. Um, that's what I've got for you tonight. So I will answer questions and let Dennis uh, say what he wants to say. Thank you. Thank you. I have a pretty different approach. I only wrote down four words. <laughs> um, well, let me just start by telling you a little bit about my background. I'm not from Michigan. I'm, a, I, I'm actually uh, born and raised in California. Well, not born in California, but pretty much raised all my life in California. Uh, I came to Michigan last year, and I actually you know, a lot of my friends, they don't even ask me if I like Michigan. They just tell me, you poor soul, or whatever. <laughs> but the funny thing is, is I, I actually came to Michigan. Uh, nobody talked me into coming to Michigan. I actually came to Michigan just because I wanted something different. I just wanted something different. I lived in California pretty much all my life. I'm an avid cyclist, and the first thing I noticed was it's pretty flat around here. <laughs> you know, and I'm used to riding 4,000 feet, you know, and it's, just, it's just a lot, it's a lot different in many, many ways. I grew up in Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara, the mountains touch the coast, right in that area. And the first thing I notice is there's no ocean and there's no mountains. So uh, it's a, it, what, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> no. <laughs> but I'm, a, I'm also an avid tennis player and um, I, uh, I, found, I found that riding around here was pretty fun, too. Uh, I, worked at a, I, like, I worked at a lot of good agencies. I started working, I started as a graph, I started as a photographer, actually. I, I, I studied photography for pretty much from about 13 years old all the way to about 20. And um, I was actually a very good, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big student of, the, of photography. I, I shot all large format growing up and learned all the, you know, very classic photography. Um, and then, and then I, um, my father really discouraged me to going into photography. He really, he thought that was a bad idea. Now you have to understand, I come from a large family. My dad's a heart surgeon. And um, um, there's a family, I grew up in a family of nine. And uh, I'm the fourth, I'm the fourth person in the family. We're in alphabetic order. Alan, Barney, Cindy, Dennis, Eric, Francine, Gina, Howard, and Irene. <laughs> Our dog was Jason. <laughs> um, anyway, my dad discouraged me to go into photography. I had a very heartfelt, I still remember the day I walked into his, his office in the house, which was called Inner Sanctum. And I walked into the room. And I was very, you know, I just, I just, uh, I was just awarded a, um, a scholarship to Brooks Institute, which is a, a big, a famous photography school in, in, in uh, Santa Barbara at the time. And, um, and I remember this, I remember crying in front of him. I was like 16 or 17, I was crying and trying to say, why won't you let me get into photography? And he wouldn't let me get into it. He, would, he had heard all his other doctor friends that had sons and daughters that had failed miserably in, the, uh, in photography. And they, he, just, he just assumed, he just thought that there was no way I'd ever make it. And uh, what ended up happening was I went into graphic design. And I went into graphic design because my father knew nothing about it. So there's no <laughs> way he could criticize me for, you know, and I figured I, I had, it was, a, it was an ironclad case of ignorance. So uh, I ended up going into graphic design and then when I, was in, I, I go, when I got out of college, I started designing and, and I got pulled into doing um, advertising through, I helped launch the Acura campaign in 1986 or 85. And, and um, I, start, I thought I was going into the job to design brochures, but it wasn't too long before they had me doing commercials and 
and I just sort of fell into advertising that way. And it worked out pretty well for me. Um, but I ended up working at a lot of really good places. The last, uh, probably the two most famous places I worked at were that most, pe most people in advertising know about are, are Hell Reine, when it was at its best, and Shite Day. And um, I'm very good friends with Lee Clow, and I knew Hell Reine pretty well, and I, um, I got along pretty well in the business and, and, and really loved the business through them. I also worked at BBDO for some time and worked on Apple, worked on I worked on uh, Infinity Cars, I worked on Saturn, I worked on um, HP, I worked on IBM. I've worked on mainly large accounts because there's not very many people stupid enough to work on large accounts. And as we all know, large accounts are the biggest pain in the asses out of all the accounts. They have the most amount of people dealing with it. There's not just one cook. You're just dealing with so much information and you're trying to weave your way through all the stuff, trying to figure out what's the answer, all while trying to have a point of view. So I guess I'm in front of you guys to tell you a little bit about some of the ways I get through some of these problems. And um, I think the first thing I could probably do is tell you the first thing that we're all dealt with, one thing at a time. Sorry, it's not aqua, uh, green, blue. The first word I'm going to write down here is, I believe that is how all great invention is. it starts off with, fear. Fear is what breeds all the things that are amazing in this world. Because when you have fear, it's the, as you know, it's the mother of invention. And we all start with fear because of intimidation by either not having the knowledge of knowing how to solve an issue or having things thrown at us or having people get mad at us. And nobody likes that human condition. <clears throat> nobody loves the human condition of being fearful. So we all try to find ways out of it. And that's where it all starts. Fear is, fear is a good thing. I mean, it's, uh, it's something that we all have to face. Um, the one thing about fear is that you have to learn, it's how you learn to deal with fear is what leads to people that are successful versus people that are not successful. Because the people that aren't successful fail at dealing with their fear. We all have to face it versus the people that are successful usually learn how to deal with fear. Now there, is a, there, is, there are a couple of instances where that's not true and that's lucky versus unlucky but you cannot count on that. <laughs> so the next, the next thing is method. The next thing you deal with is method to deal with your fear. So I'll put that down here. Now I told you I was from a family of nine. I was one of, um, you know, I was one of five boys. And, uh, and I grew up in a, I, do, I grew up in a tough, not a tough neighborhood. It's Santa Barbara doesn't have any really tough neighborhoods. But, <laughs> but when you're Chinese and you're the only Asian guy in the entire school, beside your brothers and sisters, you get picked on. You get picked on. Now, I can't, you know, I'm not, this is not a story about color. This is not a story about that kind of, I don't want to get into that on that level. That's not the point. The point is, we all have to bear some sort of cross that we, we have to deal with in our schools, and we always are different in some way or another, and our peers don't like us, or our peers do like us, or it's popular to be friendly with this guy, or it's not popular to be friendly, un, um, friendly with this guy, or whatever. My, when I was growing up, it wasn't, it wasn't that easy for me. It really wasn't. I was a, I was a shy, I was a pretty shy kid, and I was the smallest kid in my class. And you can imagine I had great amounts, great amounts of fear. But one day, um, this um, this demonstration came into the class, in, into our school, and it was an Aikido and Judo demonstration. And I was a little kid, and I always wanted to learn Judo when I was a kid. And it was strange because I'm Chinese and Judo is Japanese sport. But you got to remember back then. The only two, there was only really two major martial arts in the country back then. And that was karate and judo. 
And the reason why is because of World War II, and the Japanese have brought that into the, com into the country sort of in the 1964 Olympics. And um, I really wanted to learn judo. When I was a kid, I had seen some demonstrations, and this, this, this demonstration had taken place. And actually, I actually learned judo when I was about nine years old. I started learning judo. And it's not like a self-defense type of thing as I learned. It really was much more of a self-confidence building thing, even though the original jujitsu was actually, it was a way, you know, it was trying to find a way to kill someone with your hands, you know, I mean. But it had had, but because the, of, because of the truce between America and, and Japan, they had actually made jujitsu into judo, which was a sport. And it came, in, it came out in the 1964 Olympics. The other sport was karate, which came out of jujitsu. And then kenjutsu turned into kendo. And kenjutsu is uh, kendo, is uh, sword, uh, Japanese sword fighting. So I had learned judo for 20 years, and I had actually competed nationally and was pretty good at it. But one thing about judo, which is very common with life, is that, like transcendental meditation, you have to go into... You can, you can take in all this crap going on with all the information you're getting and all the garbage you're getting filled up with, and you're trying to manage it in your own mind, and you're trying to figure it out in your own mind. You're doing all this stuff. Well, same with judo. You're doing all these practices of learning how to deal with things, you know, learning how to deal with this guy pushing you this way or coming over you this way or coming under you like this, and you're trying to figure out how to deal with it over and over and over. We call it uchikomi. And then what happens is you get on the mat and it's empty and there's silence and there's like, you know, a bunch of guys around the mat. There's a referee in the center and you get on your hash mark and you stand up to your hash mark and you bow and the guy says, Hajime, and which means go. Or, yeah. And so you go at it and you know what? All that crap, it evaporates. And all you're left with is the guy in front of you doing all these things and all these practices that you did. All of a sudden, they take place, and magically, miraculously, you do the right thing. Or wrong. But nonetheless, you do what you know how to do, and nothing more because there's nothing more to gain from it, and nothing less because you don't know how to do any worse. And that's exactly the same thing as ideas. It's exactly the same thing as ideas. Ideas, you either, they, you just have to take in all the crap, erase your mind of everything, and then at the moment that you have to step foot on the mat and perform, you perform. And you either have it or you don't, and if you don't, you walk away, and you come back out on the mat, and you try again. And um, I learned a little thing in, um, when I was working on Infinity. In Infinity, Every car design starts with a minimal amount of lines drawn by a brush. It's actually the art of Shoto. It's um, minimalistic drawing through. It's actually how they draw characters. But it's the minimalistic lines drawing the gesture of the car. And it's amazing because you look at those gestures and you look at the final car and you get it. You go, wow, that really looks like the FX or this really looks like the M. And it's the same exact thing they do. They actually clear their mind, and then they, they, through a minimal amount of strokes, they draw what they think is the gesture of the car. And it might take them 300 times. They say on average it takes around 300 times to do it right. And it's the same thing, it's the same thing with ideas. You might have to go back to the well 300 times, but you just, you just, have to, you just know when you got it right. It just, that, that, that shoto looks perfect to you and you know you did the right thing. So that's method. Excuse me while I look at my notes. <laughs> <laughs> the third thing, and probably the most important, and that relates to the Shoto, is POV. So in the process of doing your throw or doing your creativity or doing your Shoto, you actually have finally established your point of view. And your point of view is unique to everybody else's. One time, one of my junior writers 
that I had to fire told me. He said, there's no security in this business. There's no security in this business. You know what? There's only one security in this business, and that's your portfolio. It's your portfolio. Because your portfolio demonstrates your point of view and shows your, your unique addition to the world. Your resume, your bio, your whatever you guys have that is unique to you is what you have to add to this world. And that's your POV. And some POVs, you can see it. You can see it. Imagine the world without Einstein or Hemingway or Picasso or Steve Jobs. You know, imagine how different the world would be, right? So these are guys that have really found a way to have a POV that is so strong and so powerful that you can't ignore it and it has a profound impact on the world. One of my best creative directors ever, without a doubt, was Hal Reining. He could do it all. He once told me, he said, well, he didn't tell me, he told me, my creative director at the time, uh, Dave O'Hare, he said to him, um, Dave was saying, Dave was a proponent for hiring planners in the advertising, in our, in our career, in our agency. And this is at a time when really the only successful agency with planners was Goodby and um, Shy. In America, in, in, in Europe, they had them all over the place. They were fairly common. And Hal says to, he, Hal says to Dave, well, here he says, Dave, why do we need a planner? He says, well, because, you know, they, um, for, for, for a creative person, it's really nice to have a brief so we know what we're doing an idea around and we get a sense of this whole thing. He says, he says well, what exactly does a planner do? He says, well, a planner, he, he, looks, he looks at the client. He understands what it is their business is all about. He figures out what their needs are. He figures out what the media is at play. And he figures out who the audience is. And he sort of connects all these things together to make, to make a brief which we can do an ad off of. And Hal says, sounds to me like a pretty smart guy. And he says, and Dave says, yeah, they're generally pretty smart. He says, well, Dave, you're pretty smart. Seems to me that if you hired six other smart, creative guys, you wouldn't need a fucking planner. <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> Truth of the matter is, is like, this business has changed pretty dramatically. And frankly, Hal didn't really like um, some of the businesses in the office because they did require planners. Because... You could not, one person could not possibly think of every little thing for that person. But back then, life was a lot easier when Hal was in advertising. And he, was, he had a point. It really did just take smart people. But anyway, the, the, other, the, um, the thing is, is that a point of view is what serves you best at the end of the day. And it's what, it's what we all can rely on. It's the only thing we can rely on that's going to serve ourselves up differently than everybody else. And we all have to think what our POV is. Um, right now, I'm going through this big, big thing on Chevy. The board of directors has come in and suggested that we look at other agencies, that Chevy look at other agencies. And of course, the first thing that overcomes the agency is fear. But you know what? I know my method, and I know how I would do it if I was Chevy. I know what's important to them. I know what's important to the customer. I know that the customer, pretty much in California, at least where I'm from, has pretty much all but dismissed Chevy from the choosing an Audi or choosing a Nissan or a Toyota or everybody, and fuck, even Hyundai, right? Yeah. Pretty much Chevy is the worst, there's something worse than disdain toward a company, and that's apathy. When you're not even thought of, that's even worse, because that means that you, they're not even thought of enough to have disdain for it. Right? And that's, that's Chevy. And even though they make great cars and they've, they're really a change company, 
They're really a change company. They make really great cars. The world doesn't really know about it because they pretty much dismissed them and haven't even bothered to go over that fence to see if they have good cars, right? So there's this big wall between us. I happen to have a lot of fear about succeeding. But I, have, I also have a strong point of view. I also have my ways of getting my ideas across. And I go, I have nothing to lose because if the end of the day, at the end of the day, I have my point of view, I have my portfolio, and if they don't like what we have to do, then it's to their loss, not mine, because I believe in what I'm doing is right, right? And I would call that the last stage, which is courage. So it's ironic how fear breeds courage. And that's my talk. Thank you very much. All right, so I didn't prepare any questions because I thought it would be great for us to kind of just have a, a chat about a few of the topics here. I think it's great to, to bring up a few of these things because it's not something we talk about every day. You know, we talk about creative executions. We talk about the plan is. We talk about how we're going to sell something to somebody. But we never talk about how we kind of use this to help us, you know, help guide us. We use the five rules to help guide us. And I think about my kind of time for quiet or my, you know, watch pot never boils moment literally is in the shower. It's the only place that no one can bug me. The phone, if the phone rings, I can't hear it. If my Blackberry goes off, I don't care. You don't have the Velcro suit and the collar on yet. Right, I don't have the Velcro <laughs> suit and the collar on yet. Um, but it gives me that time to think. Now, I do have a piece of paper and a pen outside of it, so when I do have those moments of brilliance, I can not lose it. But, you know, it's, it's, it's just the opportunity for me to clear everything. And you'd be amazed, and I'm sure you guys all are thinking about what your place is. Could be like when you're riding your bike or, um, when you're blow drying your hair or tying your shoes or you know getting ready for work whatever it is um, so it's, it's kind of fun to think about those things I also think the the fear breeding courage piece of it I, I have a little story today um, we're going through our upfronts for Ford and there's a lot of controversy around you know what to do in the digital space and everybody's like oh no you can't do that oh no you can't do that oh you shouldn't do that you're never gonna get that approved and we all just thought to ourselves no. Yes, we have fear that we're not going to get it approved, right? We all have that, oh my gosh, is, is you know, our senior management and client leads really going to think what we say is important and accurate? Fear. Fear brought us to a place where we went in front of the clients today and they're like, huh, yeah, for sure. You know, you have everything here that you built, all of the sound rationale, and, you know, we walked out going, oh my gosh, that was easy. But it also took us three weeks. It took us 70 plus hours per person to get to that point. So the fear drove us to walking in there with a level of courage and being able to be confident in what we have to say and be convicted and you know, provide our POV in you know, really bringing that to life and, and driving business forward. So you think about it, it doesn't even have to, it's not professional, it can be in your personal lives. It's all of those things that kind of Mary, it's good build questions. Up. Yeah. Please. I'm, I'm not an advertising, um, although I am an advertiser's daughter. So um, I've lived a little bit of this life. And I just want to, I want to pose a question to all of you. What if, instead of fear, your undercurrent was love? And what if, instead of thinking, about building your POV, or what I might refer to as perspective, and sharing perspective to perspective, you started to also think about the simplicity of interaction, and introduced compassion into the simplicity of interaction. I don't know uh, in 
in my life any time where fear has motivated me toward the best of my ability. Generally, fear paralyzes me. When I talk about transcendental med meditation, and this is not a talk about TM, but I just want to toss this out really, really quickly. When we think about thinking, okay, thinking, we're all thinking all the time, that's all surface level stuff, right? Thinking, thinking, thinking. And somebody says to you, close your eyes and have all the thoughts come out of your head and don't scratch your nose, what happens? <laughs> you know, your mind goes crazy, right? TM as a meditation brings you, it's a scientific technique using a sound based mantra to bring you to that absolute silent self. All of us at basis are the same. I am you and you are me, literally. That's quantum physics. That is physics. We study matter and we break it down and break it down and break it down and what we know is at the very, very basis of the world, we are all one. And what if, I'm posing the question, we operated from that sense of connectivity? And from that sense of deep silence? And I would even pose the question, and I love thinking, I, I'm, I'm very attracted to sort of stories, people stories, life stories. You know, when Dennis brought up Einstein or Steve Jobs or any of those people, that's intriguing to me, how those people sort of make that kind of life, that kind of identity for themselves, that kind of perspective, it's very powerful. And yet I would venture to say that they don't get there by themselves. They all have mamas who love them, or most of them do. They all have friends. And it's the cumulative layers of interaction amongst all of us that push up those people to the top. We all play our part because of the way we all interact. And we all choose actively whether we realize it or not. And this gives us all a tremendous amount of power. If you're driving your 1979 Nova down the lodge every day to work and it's raining all the time, I gotta tell you, you gotta think about the choices you're making. We actively choose our lives through our thoughts, through our interactions. We actively choose our roles and our routines. And we all work in tandem together. Like I said, it was brilliant. I'm talking about distraction, and what happens? Nice job. Thank you. <laughs> We're working together. Thank you. Brilliant. He writes down fear, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm binary opposition. I'm talking about love. <laughs> we work together. We work together, and we make connections. And it becomes a platform, then, to think about how it is that we can take aspects of each other, it's almost like cooking, putting it in a pot and stirring it up. And when you start looking for patterns and you start playing this game, all you see all the time are coincidences, synchronicity. And we all have that experience, thinking about somebody see them in the grocery store. But we can create that as a life pattern. And it's fun. And as I stand here, and I, I didn't mean to steal anyone's thunder, but I hate to think, I hate to think of you suffering. It's a scary world out there. I don't know anything mm -hmm. about BBDO, but I heard they got bad news. I feel safe about them. <laughs> My dad worked for Chrysler for 30 years. It sucks to be a Chrysler retiree. But you get to choose how you react. Then you get to choose how it is that you think about these things. And I believe optimism breeds optimism. 
And love breeds love, and compassion breeds compassion, and creativity breeds creativity. And we're all born with our essence of being creative souls. No one's better at it than anybody else. And that's the ultimate irony. Yes, oh, sir? we have a question. I love it. <laughs> I would think that maybe love could be inserted somewhere in between method and POV. I'm not disagreeing that it can't be a starting point, because if we're going to be semantic about the word love and fear and how one could be the other, then maybe some fear, whereas when you jump into your mother's arms the first time she's in the pool and you learn how to swim, sure. her love, based on your fear, Beautiful. the method how you got there generated your point of view of moving forward. Well, method, method is love. Exactly. Fear, I, I'm saying that is a very, it's a very um, universal human feeling. It's reptilian. It's not cerebral. Mm -hmm. And and uh, everybody has fear. I would I would argue that the people that you always say, he knows no fear. Those are the guys that have the most fear. Right. Right. And that the difference is is that they have achieved some sort of method of overcoming that fear, which is my point. There's always a way to overcome a fear. And it could be love, it could be fighting, it could be argument, it could be it could be a million different ways of doing it. But everybody has a different way of doing it. But everybody has to face it. The other thing too about that, and I, I agree with Dennis, is that fear and love are both abstractions. And emotions are actually abstractions. And Really, what we are as human beings are bodies that emotions move through. We're filters for emotions to move through. I mean, we could get into a whole conversation about energy work. But generally, what we are is emotions. And as human beings, what we do is we attach those emotions that are moving through us to external situations. So, you know, really nothing's scary. And really nothing's pleasant. Or maybe everything's pleasant, but nothing's really exciting. I mean, we're so busy all the time evaluating what it is that we're in, that we're not even really able to stay suspended in the moment. Whereas if we can sort of recognize, hey, I'm attaching fear to this external circumstance, but nothing really can happen here. And when you start to pull yourself back from that, I think it's very empowering. You think about how, how, how do you start to build that into your day? I mean, how do you start to build that into the things that you know that you have to accomplish every day? You know, a lot of the things are kind of up here, but you really can start to, to attach yourself or feel that there's some, that you have some relevance with that, with, with what we've talked about. Um, I, I, I think what we all probably should walk away with tonight is some level of what exactly, what exactly are these things? that will help us do what we need to do daily. Um, and especially in the space that most of us live in, in the digital space. It's not something you can actually pick up for the most part and take with you, right? You have to express yourself. You have to kind of overcome these things when you're trying to um, sell something to somebody that they can't take with them really and, and, and kind of digest themselves. So it's, a, it's an interesting kind of opposition of thinking that you know, we live in this world that's kind of virtual, that you can't touch, really, um, for the most part. And how, how do you start to apply some of the rules and some of the, the, the fear factor and the love factor and all that kind of stuff into your daily world? Um, and it's probably a little bit of a different thing than you may have been expecting tonight, but I think it probably helps us, especially in a time of uncertainty here in Detroit. Um, uncertainty and you know what do we want to do with the rest of our lives it doesn't even have to be in the automotive world but you know what what is it that you want to accomplish and how do you bring those more positive thoughts to the table um, and and I, I do agree absolutely that optimism breeds optimism you know you walk into a room and you have a frown on your face what's that gonna do you walk into a room with a smile on your face it's completely different mode um, so I don't know just thoughts anybody I, have I'd like to ask a question mm -hmm. absolutely okay. You know, I'm hearing about fear and love, and I'm hearing about change in the domestic advertising or automotive advertising category, and I'm hearing about people losing their jobs and all this injustice, and um, quite frankly, 
I'd like to hear more about the opportunity all this creates mm -hmm. for people who really want to step up to the plate and make a change in this business. Because no matter how hard it seems or no matter how, you know, how it'd be easy to lose faith in the place that we're in right now, there's still plenty that can be done to improve things. Mm -hmm. And I, I think digital is a very strong space, but I don't think it's the only space. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's part of the palette a creative person has to communicate what they need to about a brand or to address whatever marketing objective has been set forth and figure out a compelling way to engage with the consumer. But I, you know, but fear um, itself can be an obstacle as opposed to a motivating uh, factor. You know, we all hear about fear of failure and about how that motivated the astronauts and all that exciting stuff. But there's creativity, there's excellence, there's breakthrough, there's original ideas, you know, there's, there's ways of taking mundane thinking and turning it into something exciting. And that's, I would think, what people in the creative business are looking to hear about right now. What about this new movie, hope. Paranormal Activity? I mean, two out-of-work actors who make a movie for what they spend on it, $25,000, and it's grossed, I mean, at the first weekend, it grossed $68 million. That is really creativity in action and taking an opportunity and shifting it to your own benefit. What is the YouTube phenomenon? And and we can say, oh, it's it's not for us. Oh, you know, I you know I don't want to be a part of it. But you know, listen, people are making it out that way. And what about the opportunity to create more flexible institutions? What about the opportunity to infuse institutions? with more optimism, with more with meditation spaces or yoga spaces or you know, um, karate spaces or any of the kinds of things that can get us back to who we really want to be. And what about community and pulling together? And what about shifting our sense of what it means to be successful? I think I see loads of opportunity mm -hmm. right now in the world. I mean, the structures are really, truly changing. And, and I think, honestly, I mean, that, that's, that's really what we wanted to bring today. And I, I, you captured it far better than, than I did. But mm -hmm. it's really looking for those places of open opportunity. And it's... Well, there's a lot of opportunity yeah. right now. There's a ton it's of a opportunity. It's a crazy time to be part of this business. But yeah. Yeah, you it can is put a the fear time. aside and just In an exciting ride time. it out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. Connection.com? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just no, it's a common connection Detroit. So. Ah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a LinkedIn community that we started to cool. just help each other. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's it. It's a great connection. Yeah. But you don't have to go there. It's more of an example to what we were talking about. It's a 
Somebody else had their hand raised up in there. Doug? At what point does the true essence of creativity get shaken up or changed by the fact that you have to make a block off your creativity as opposed to you know what you want to do? I mean, does now uh, making a business out of it that becomes your creativity and then now you have to take care of your family and your kids? It takes a back burn to what your true essence of your creativity is. Well, that's a good question. That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Email it back to me. I don't want to waste any more time. But, you know, what I was talking about was far more basic than what you're talking about. You're talking about something that's extended into um, needs to fulfill. I have a family, and I, I have to, you know, I have, I have, uh, I have a tremendously complicated, complicated life be, living in two cities, and what that what that forces me to do and what it forces me to, um, how it forces me to think. The reality is, is that you, you know, you, there's no, there's no magic bullet. You know, as, 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 as things get, as, as times get tougher, we have to, the creativity in that case gets directed to trying to invent how you can be useful in the workforce. I mean, ironically, it's not your creativity is no longer creativity of like I have this idea, let's you know let's let's figure out a way to make liquid aluminum into into something clear. You know, it's not, that that it goes away from that though. What's that? Do you think it takes away from that? Like they were saying, hey, we got to find fire because we need the heat. Yeah, it does. So now you have I can to go and think of some you know the yeah. best way to, to impress the car people and maybe take away from the innovation a little bit. Well, it does and it doesn't. <laughs> Because at a certain time, at a certain point, you're you are found. So you may you may be able to come up with a solution that you think solves the problem temporarily, but it forces you to think of how it's going to solve it permanently because it's the welfare of both you, your idea, and um, it's and when you submit it, being able to being able to get the job, and being able to do the job and making it. A, and, and and helping out in your credibility. So it, it there's no easy answer. I mean, there's only certain. Look at. I actually like the last question because it relates to your question or the the gentleman that stepped over here. What I like about that question is, it, it you know I mean it's a stupid banal saying to say that every, you know the closing of every door opens up another door, right? But it's true. It's true. As one business changes, another business opens, because it's the nature of mankind. It, it, it has been the it has been the existence of this world from the very beginning. I mean, from the very beginning. Every time something changes, something else opens. I still remember. Um, I still remember hearing from an old timer in advertising telling me that his biggest crisis is when television came about. He says, what's going to happen with print advertising and newspaper? That was his biggest fear. And, you know, you didn't even realize, well, wait, there's this whole thing called TV that, and it, it, you know, we all know what happened with TV. And same with TV, which, with, with what's happening with the Internet. With every, with, you just, it's not just the media, too. It's cars, like you said. Well, what's happening with cars? So as, car, as the doors close and these big three change, what happens with the other opportunities elsewhere? Look what's happening with the Koreans and the Chinese. You know what my first thought was when I was working on Infinity and I started not liking the way things were going with that company and I decided, well, maybe I should do a change? My first thought wasn't work on a car company. My first thought was, I'm going to go to China because you know what? There's all kinds of commerce happening there. So with every with every opportunity there is with every I don't know with every failure with every change there is a new opportunity. That's where the facing the fear comes in. Yes. Right. Okay. There is another thing that I used to say. It's not the people in the world. It, it it comes down 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 to another reptilian aspect. There's fear, right? The biggest the biggest survival instinct we have is adaptation. And if you think about it, like, I mean, my thought of going to China was actually a very good thought. I mean, yeah, I'd miss my family. You know, there'd be all kinds of stuff that I'd have to sacrifice. But you know what? 
you know, if I did it right and I went to China and I learned how the Chinese do business, wouldn't I become a value to someone somewhere else? So that's how you have to think. You can't, I mean, I think the biggest problem we all have is the, we all, we all put up our own burdens. I must stay in Michigan. I must stay in California. I must do this. I must do that. The whole reason I came to Michigan instead of going to China was, well, let me see if I can survive in this country first in a different place than California before I go out to China. That was actually one of the first, that's actually what I thought. But I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thanks. Okay. I can hear it. I can hear you, but you can use it still. Is identity issues. You know, the comment about, am I compromising my creativity? And then the comment is, but sometimes when I feel compromised, I can work in different collaboratives. And then I want to take it all the way out here, and I want to say, but that's making an assumption that only you are creative. Do you, do you know, that creativity is an aspect of only you. And it's forgetting that it's an aspect of all of us. It's not just something you picked up on the Velcro soup. It's actually who you are, what you were born with. So if you're baking a cake, you're creative. If you're washing the floor, you're being creative. If you're interacting, if you're alive and breathing, you're being creative. Well, wait, and I think what, when what you start to anything, <laughs> anything. I think when we start to define ourselves as creative, this is where a lot of the stress comes in. Because then what ends up happening is we have to be successful all the time. And every idea has to feel like a good idea because we're evaluating our creativity. And and that's where a lot of that problem comes from. Whereas if you just say all the time to yourself, I am creative, I was born creative, at my very essence, I am creativity in action, then you no longer have to weigh it or evaluate it or wonder if a good idea, bad idea, because all ideas are ideas. Does that make any sense? I mean, it's sort of a philosophical argument, and it might not work when you're presenting something to your client. And yet I think it's a very powerful ideology to live with inside of yourself. They say sacred is silent. I think if you know that, truly know that internally, it's almost your little crystal in your heart, you know that I really know that, then you move away from that fear of, is this a good idea, are they going to like it? Because you like it. Because it's an idea that came out of you, because you're creative. Because at essence, that's who you are. Not because some days you are and some days you aren't, but because you always are. You know, you're running out of creative ideas, and then you're thinking in terms of like, the communal aspect of it on drawing ideas? Is that what you meant? Well, when you're, when you're working on a project, you've all been there where you feel like everybody, you have certain goals you have to meet for a client, but then you have a certain idea in, in your head, and you have to kind of come up with something where you feel like maybe your creativity gets pushed to the wayside so that you can meet the exact needs. You know what I mean? Where you, right. Where you feel because it, it suddenly becomes a cerebral problem instead of a a creative problem. Right. So you're just solving it based on, it's no longer, it's all by the numbers as opposed to doing it right. right. When a bottom line is shoved into your face and you have, you feel like maybe you might come to the point where you feel like you're, you're Do you feel dissatisfied with your solutions when you come up with no, solutions for that? No, if it's just been a, you know, a long day or a long project, when I, when I feel myself feeling that way, I start to look at it like, okay, what I'm doing instead is creating a different way to meet the needs of, of what we're doing. Right. 
Right. It's not an elegant. It's not necessarily an elegant solution. You feel like you're. It's maybe less than the potential of what the idea could be. Right. I see. That's part of life, though, too, is learning the rules and the expectation of, of institution. And you know, it's like I have to write a syllabi every semester. You know, for my students, and I have to use a template. You know that the dean of the department basically writes for me, and I hate it. I hate templates. I hate it <laughs> because I feel so caged Don't get me in. Started. You know, it, it cages me in, and I can't use what it is that I want to use, what I know would really be the right thing for my students. But I think that when you really, I th I think that when you really learn the rules of the institution, expectation of the institution, that's that electric dog collar. You're better able to meet that but also scoot around those boundaries. I think what happens is when we're confused about what expectations are, that's when we end up feeling like we're not really having so much fun. Because there's a lot of joy in meeting an expectation for the institution and really doing it right and precisely, even when your ideas come out of it. Because you know you did a really good job and you knew exactly what everybody wanted from you. There's, I think that's a very satisfying feeling. But you have to really know what those expectations are. And if you don't know them, that's where I think that feeling of, of dissatisfaction comes because you're getting that, you know, you're getting this. Because you're not really reading the institution the right way. And you're trying to walk right through a boundary. Let me ask you something about, I gotta ask you one more question about that. Do, do you feel like the parameters they're putting around the problem are in the way of a better idea. Like, you're at the end of the day, you've come up with a lot of ideas, and you go, my idea of how to solve this would be better than the idea we're arriving at with the parameters around it. Should I get, you know, are the parameters actually in, in, inhibiting the issue, inhibiting the creativity? Sure, I think everybody has felt that way before. Like, you must use this template, you must use this person, or you must use this, or you must do that. But those things right. are in the way. Don't you feel slighted a bit, though, because you're like, you hired me for my creativity, and you're not taking me out Absolutely. And you're like, you're the head of marketing. Every damn day of my life, life, I feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. No, but seriously, and then sometimes, you can, sometimes there's ways of using what they're giving you to create an elegant solution that you would have never thought of. And you surprise yourself and you surprise everybody around you. Because, I mean, you know one of the hardest clients I ever worked on, believe it or not, was Apple. Apple was one of the hardest clients I ever worked on. Because their expectations were so high. And then also the things that they wanted to do and they always wanted, you know, they, they, they had so much. This is when Jobs was out of it again. You know, Scully was in, Jobs was out. It was it was insane, but you that you would always surprise yourself with what you'd arrive at based on the. I guess that works because they really do have some of the best design that's out there. I mean, yeah, it does. But it's like becoming a kind of a mess at that point too. Yeah. Were they were bit lost. They were really lost. Well, the thing is, you know what they wanted to do, which, which was, which was right and wrong. They had a small, small percentage of the computer marketing business. And they realized that the bigger part of the business was in business. And they were a personal computer for, for home. And what they wanted to do was expand their business to the outside. And we came up with this campaign that was the idea was the more, you know, it's, it's you know, they were saying that Intel, the, the Intel IBM based computers, PCs, were more powerful computers. But when they did the actual thing, they found out that people actually preferred to use Apple for Macs. So they, the idea was, isn't the more powerful computer the one that you actually want to use? And that became the idea. But we didn't know how, we didn't know what to do with it because they really, they, we were getting beaten, we were getting beaten on every possible level. So we just turned it into, what were we good at? We're good at, you know, and that's how you have to think. I guess there lies a challenge then. And then sometimes you got to do what they don't want you to do. I still remember when Hal Ryan, we were working on the electric car. This is before. This is before the Volt. This is the original electric car. EV1. 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 Because they thought there would be an EV2, by the way. Um, and they had. They, they, we were doing the EV1. And the idea that 
um, we came up with was the electric car from the not so General Motors. And we actually went over, Hal and a group of us went to General Motors, not me, but a bunch of them went to General Motors and they, they got in a room with, with these five guys and they said, we have, you know, they, they unveiled the idea, the EV1 from the not so General Motors. And the guy says, we can't do it. And Hal says, why not? And he says, well, because it's negative. He says, why is it negative? He says, because you're using the word not. <laughs> you know, typical, it's a typical NBA advertising thing, right? And, and, we, and he says, well, I beg to differ. I would say the only negative word in that entire statement is general. <laughs> and the guy, the guy thought about it and he says, okay, I'm with you. He says, so what if we go with this plan? And Hal says, well, you tell me. If you, after the EV1, what's next? And they all looked at each other and they had no idea. And they, they actually had no idea they had this EV1 at the time. They barely knew that. He says, and Hal just looked at it and he says, I suggest you go out and you talk to your people to see what's, what they're working on because maybe you have something out there that might actually be something that this country wants. But that's working against what they, I mean, that's, sometimes you have to, why, why I was asking that question is I want, there's sometimes when you have to say, you know what, the parameters you're putting on us, they're, they're stopping you from doing something really great. You gotta, you gotta be courageous enough to say that at times. And then other times you gotta go, geez, maybe there's something, maybe there's something here. You know, so it just depends on the situation and that's, that's where the thinking comes in. We have time for one more question. I have a comment. Oh, <laughs> 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 I think uh, the opposite, uh, a little bit of what you're saying and what some of you are saying. I'm not a, I'm not a creative in an ad agency, um, but I think if you embrace the fact that we're all creative, um, you should embrace constraints because when we think about some of the people out there who really, really inspire us, um, the Helen Kellers of the world, the blind mountain climbers of the world, the Einsteins without computers of the world, it was all about constraints whether they realized they had them or not. And if somebody puts you in a solitary confinement in a box all by yourself with no contact with any other human beings, you could still be creative because you would still have your mind. And you would still be able to do what you need to do. So when someone assigns you constraints, I think it's all about your attitude towards those constraints. Whether that constraint is profitability or someone else's expectations or somebody else's rules, that just raises the bar for you. Well, to a great illustration of that to is, be creative. what's more creative, a $100,000 Tesla or a $40,000 bull? Yeah, exactly. That's that holds exactly four it. people. No, I, 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 I hundred percent agree. If you have no boundaries, I of course agree. you can freaking be creative. It's yeah. when you have the boundaries that your your creativity is really. Amazing. Yeah, no, 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 no. That, and that's, it's also that's when you true. know what your boundaries are me, and you're actively working within them that you have the most freedom. And that's an enormous irony that I think is really hard for people to get their heads wrapped around. But. Your, your comment is so on, it's a great comment to end this conversation on, is when you understand the boundaries of the institution or the constraints of the project, truly understand them and don't react to them with emotionality. That's when you have the most freedom. And it's, an, a, huge, it's, a, it's a huge irony. It's a huge irony. But it's when you can really learn a lot and grow a lot and seek a lot of opportunity, um, and I and I, I think I think that part of that psychosis that we all live with is that we don't know what our boundaries are anymore, and I think that's a big part of what I was trying to get across today, is that you know I I, I used to teach a class um, a humanities course. I love teaching this class. It was like a freshman required course. It's a humanities course. And we would start in like 1880 with Impressionism. And we would go tick tock, tick tock, tick tock through all of the art movements. Any of you who've taken an art history 
class would know how we would do this. You know, we start, you know, the, the, the camera's developed, this leads to expressing emotion in art, impressionism, then we talk about color, the fobs, blah, 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 blah. And we move, sort of historically, just like this. Ba -ba 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 -ba. And what happens? We get to the late 60s. Some people say earlier than that, maybe Andy Warhol. And there's an explosion, just an explosion of ideas. And it's much harder to mitigate our reality when we're bombarded by that imagery and that noise and that multiplicity of roles, that layered way of being, of interacting all of the time in different ways and in different ways of knowing it becomes much more confusing. And so if you can figure out a way to see what your constraints are and understand your constraints within that fragmented world and then operate within them, there's great opportunity for real creativity. Great. It's interesting. Yeah. Well, great. Well, again, thank you very much for taking the time this evening.